that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, I want to invite you to this time of worship, but especially to my young disciples, so that we may have this time together just for you. I don't know if you've noticed, but many books have a section that tells you all about the author. Most include a very nice and very professional photo of the person who wrote the book. And then they go on to tell you all about the many books that they have written, and about the many accomplishments that they have achieved, and the awards that they've won. But this one book is different. On this page, there simply was a black and white picture of a little boy in the second grade. He's missing a tooth. And yet he's still giving the camera a big toothy grin. And the page says, when Dave Pilkey was a kid, he suffered from ADHD, dyslexia, and behavioral problems. Dave was so disruptive in class that his teachers made him sit out in the hall every day. Fortunately, Dave liked to draw and make up stories. So he spent his time in the hallway drawing his own original comic books. In the second grade, Dave created a comic book about a superhero named Captain Underpants. His teacher ripped it up and told him that he couldn't spend the rest of his life making silly books. Fortunately, Dave was not a good listener. Dave went on to create award-winning and best-selling books for children, including his Captain Underpants series which has sold more than 80 million copies worldwide and has been translated into more than 28 languages. It went on to be a movie and a TV show that's now being aired on Netflix. And one of his books, called The Paper Boy, actually went on to be a Call the Cut on book. Now I ask you this, which description is more impressive? Which is more inspiring? Do you know that every single person that you can think of, every great politician, every famous actor, every singer or writer or painter or scientist or sports star, every single person that you know has a story like this. People don't usually share stories like this. About all of their struggles, about all of their pain, about all of the hard work and sleepless nights, about all of their mistakes and faults and failures. Wouldn't it be so much better if they did? Friends, no one is perfect. That's because we're all human. And the Bible tells us that all people fall short of the glory of God. But we do serve perfect God. And so humbly we turn to God for help. We ask for God's guidance when we don't know the way. We ask for God's help when we struggle. We ask for God's grace when we make mistakes. And we ask for God's forgiveness when we do something wrong. God doesn't expect perfection. But no matter what, our perfect God will be with us every imperfect step along the way. Amen.
Hear now the words from Romans, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And, the, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also inter interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death along. Let me restart that again. For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us, loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David, until he had finished building his own house, and the house of the Lord, and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place, and Solomon used it to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in the place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. 
and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and you have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, a young king went to a high place to use for worship, and he slept in the sanctuary, hoping to dream of divine revelation. In his dream, God asked the king for his heart's desire. Wisdom, the king said. This pleased the Lord, because the king had not asked for a long life, or for riches, or for the lives of his enemies. So the Lord blessed the king with a listening heart, and with a wise and discerning mind, so that the king could discern between good and evil, and so that he could use this knowledge to lead his people. What a sweet story. Oh, this could be such a simple sermon today. And with the state of life in the world, a simple sermon seems like a really nice treat. Oh, I could preach about the wisest man in the world, Solomon, the superhero. Simple, sweet, and wrong. You may remember another story about Solomon. A time when two women come before his throne, each claiming that a baby is her child. And Solomon uses this divinely given wisdom to judge which woman is telling him the truth. Here in this story, it certainly feels like that wisdom is at work. And yet, I can't help but think, and you may also remember other less wise stories about Solomon. How Solomon goes on to manipulatively and violently take over the throne. How he accrues vast numbers, I mean hundreds, of wives and concubines. And how he builds the temple, yes, but how he enslaves Israelites to do it. The truth is that Solomon was no superhero. No, Solomon's story was complicated. In fact, Solomon's story is actually an introduction to a long and sad and very complicated saga of all of Israel's kings. So what's most fascinating to me is that much of these seemingly unwise choices and these flaws and these failings would have already been abundantly clear by the time that this story of Solomon's immense wisdom was written. It's not like it was written and then, oops, over time they realized that maybe Solomon wasn't quite so wise after So why does scripture 
knowing what's going to happen next, include this story. The trouble is the same now as it was then. We tend to turn our heroes into idols. Have you noticed this? There are some people whose names and whose stories become so iconic that they transform into some sort of superhuman. One mere mention and you automatically know who they are and you think that you know their story. Thomas Jefferson. Albert Einstein. Mother Teresa. Martin Luther King Jr. John F. Kennedy. We aggrandize them, we lionize them, we deify them. And yet, by making idols out of people who are merely human, with all of the frailties and failings that come with that humanity, it seems to me that either one of two things can happen. First, when we learn that our superhuman idols are indeed merely people, when we're surprised to learn that the freedom-proclaiming Jefferson owned slaves, that Einstein and MLK and JFK all cheated on their wives, and that Mother Teresa may not have been so saintly, then the tower of your legacy can all come crashing down. Our society is currently grappling with this question. Are heroes or humans? They were men and women who did great things, but who also may have done really terrible and atrocious things by our, our understanding today. And we find ourselves asking, how far is too far? Where is the line? when a hero can no longer be considered a hero? It's an important question with no easy answers. And it's a question that I believe we should grapple with and face together. So that's the first thing that can happen. And the second thing, by making our human heroes into idols, we build the names and the stories of these men and women up so big and place them on pedestals so high that we mere mortals can never reach them. We can never be as good or as smart or as virtuous as them. So why even try? Did you know that students who learn about famous scientists' struggles will perform significantly better in their science classes than students who are merely given a laundry list of those same scientists' achievements. Researchers studied a group of 400 students from the Bronx and Harlem. Some of the students read about the scientists' accomplishments as they might read them in a traditional textbook, while other groups of students read about these same scientists' personal struggles and their professional hurdles. After six weeks, the kids who read about these obstacles tended to improve their grades in their science classes. And amazingly, the kids with the lowest scores at the start of the study benefited and improved the most. The researcher said, the students who read about Einstein's and Curie's complicated lives full of tireless nights and unceasing challenges were much more likely to feel motivated to learn. Perhaps this is why so many heroes of classical literature very intentionally 
had flaws. We see this in the stories of Achilles and King Lear and Othello, whose characters' flaws were inseparable from their heroism. And I would argue that perhaps this is why our Bible is filled with so many imperfect heroes. Abraham was old. Joseph was abused. Moses had a speech problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. The Samaritan woman was divorced. Noah was a drunk. Jeremiah was young. David was a murderer. Jonah ran from God. Peter denied Christ three times. And the disciples, well, they never seemed to understand anything that Jesus was saying. Friends, the point of our passage is not to celebrate just how wise Solomon was, because in truth, how does that help us? How does it help to remember back to a wise king who lived long, long ago? When I look out on our world today, run by leaders from all sides who do not seem to be very wise, now that kind of unhelpful nostalgia is not the point of our story. Instead, I am reminded of this quote. Harry Potter, who is one of my own personal heroes, Harry says, I just feel so angry all the time. What if after everything that I've been through, something's gone wrong inside me? What if I'm becoming bad? And his godfather's advice is truly remarkable. And it's always stuck with me. He says to Harry, you're not a bad person. You're a very good person who bad things have happened to. Besides, the world isn't split into good people and villains. We've all got both light and dark inside us. What matters is the part that we choose to act on. That's who we really are. So what's the point of the Solomon story? The point is that our heroes were human. The point is that on our own, we are not enough. Solomon and king after king after king that followed him proved over and over and over again that they were undeniably human filled with both light and dark. Time and time again, they tell us that our leaders are not saviors and that we so desperately need a savior. Solomon points the way to the Messiah, to a Messiah who is more than a king and more than a hero. But even more personally than this, the point is that like Solomon, we are human too. Even with all of our gifts and all of our good intentions, we are merely human. And we will inevitably fall short on our own. So what do we do? Like Solomon, the Bible tells us we humbly pray for wisdom. We pray to God for guidance. We pray for a listening heart and an understanding mind. And then, with humility, we ask for grace. We do the very best that we can and we turn to God 
for help. That's the lesson. That's the point. Friends, as you face this day and this week and every day in this life ahead before you, pray for wisdom, then ask for a whole lot of grace. Amen. Uh-huh.